All right. So we are live. This is Authors Unite, and I'm Alan Huntsman. And I'm CK. And we are going to talk a little bit more about how readers can best help authors without necessarily spending a lot of money. If you missed it, we did a similar video with a few other participants last week, and we will link to that in the description. Awesome. So uh, one of my first, first thoughts that come to my mind on this topic is, I, I, on Twitter all the time, I'll see, you know, an author posting about, oh, I've got so many words done today and everybody's happily cheering them on, congrats, you know. And then the minute they post their book, nobody uh, responds at all. And this used to kind of upset me quite a bit. But in some of our discussion earlier before recording, you made me realize, CK, that, you know, an author, or I mean, a reader, they have to, like you said, invest a lot of time in reading the book. They have to invest some money in the book. And I need to be a bit more understanding of that. And I should be considering the fact that I myself purchase books and review them, but I also am an author on, on the side as well. So, <laughs> but that used to really kind of kind of ticked me off a little bit when I would see that. But yeah, there's an investment going in there that we have to be understanding of. I think one thing to also note about the Twitter, um, like the whole Twitter community, a lot of authors have mainly other authors as followers and not as many readers. So it's really easy to like, yay, I support your writing. And then, yeah, but I don't actually have time to read every book of the 20,000 people I follow, but I can encourage you on your own journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. So at least there's something you can offer that can help. Yeah. It's a good point. You were, you were mentioning something um, about like author lists and stuff like that, emails that authors can can send out to readers. Want to mention something on that again? <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of authors try to build an email list, like a list of readers who get a book for free and then in return sign up to this email list to get newsletters from us. And of course can easily just sign out again, like unsubscribe. And the thing I kind of want to make clear about that is that we do that for very specific reasons and we do that well knowing that we will not be paid for the book we give out for free so as a reader you should never ever feel guilty for accepting a free book because we actually do that to well one to give you a free book because we want people to read our stuff and two because it honestly does help us even if it's not um dollars in the bank account. Yeah, and I mean, that, that person that gets that free book and reads it, they could post a review of it. And that review of your book is going to push it through algorithms. And then somebody else could end up buying it later. So you're right, it's, it's helping everyone all around. That's an excellent point. What we want more than anything is people who enjoy our work enough to stick around for it. So by that, I mean, if you enjoy one book, then stick around. And if you don't, then you can leave and we won't hold it against you and we won't be upset by it. Because ultimately, what you like and what we give have to be a match for either of us to get anything out of this. Absolutely. And we do get just as much out of giving away free books as you do. It is not charity or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, if they, they don't like it, we don't want them around, that's for sure, because we will be unpleasant to one another. <laughs> but Also, just a waste of time. Like, don't follow authors you don't like, because you're wasting your own time, and you're wasting our time, and no one gains anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're correct on that. Um, so when it comes to reviews... Like writing a review, CK, what do you feel is the most effective type of review? 
Oh, <laughs> I'll admit I haven't written a lot of reviews myself and I haven't received a lot of reviews, but I did receive two for my book concerning death that both said, they had this one thing in common where they both said that this is not a classical thriller. Like it's not a typical thriller the way it's set up or anything, but it is so good regardless. And I was so pleased with that because I don't really write to genre or to market or anything. I just write what the story wants in a way, like start at one point and see where we end up and yeah. doing something outside of the expectations. That was kind of a pat on the shoulder for me. <laughs> have you have you written many reviews yourself or did you say no you I'm not, i haven't really written many like i'll maybe on goodreads star a book just to get recommendations based on that but i feel like as a writer when i read stuff i am overly critical on really specific points like i have a lot of pet peeves and those are not necessarily helpful for readers who don't write themselves to read in a review and reviews are for readers not for writers so right yeah, that's a good point you just made there at the end readers are or reviews are for readers not writers that's something maybe i could apply so i i have a channel called mm -hmm. death ground reviews and i I read various horror stories or fantasies, and then I do a video where I review it. But I've realized when I think back on some of the videos I did, they are very writer focused. Like I, I emphasize certain craft elements, certain sentence structure things, certain, you know, that maybe a reader isn't really that interested in. And so maybe I need to balance that better and just incorporate, just talk about things that. I don't know if you would say they're more surface things or because maybe maybe as when I'm focusing on the craft, I'm getting too deep into the into the elements of the writing of the story that readers wouldn't identify with as easily. But um, maybe I need to balance that out more when I do a review. I think um, if we take it out of the writing sort of mentality and take an other craft like carpentry then reviewing a chair or a table or something for someone to buy means looking at the result, not the tools used. Even if you, are, you yourself are a carpenter and can see that maybe they chose the wrong tool for this, but they still made the table in the end and the table isn't wobbly or anything. So yeah. I think that's my problem too and why I don't review a lot because I'm always like, oh, you used that tool. I definitely wouldn't have done that. That, If you had used this one instead, that would have been smoother. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great description of it, yeah. Hmm. That's something to think about. When, another question I have. Um, when you're reading a review, do you like the review, because I've seen both, do you like the review to summarize the plot to like the halfway point, or do you prefer it to summarize it to the end? I basically just always skip the summary. No, really? Okay. I'm like, I don't really, I'm not a plot person. I like characters and I like world building and well, specifically characters. That is my main focus. And yeah. then secondarily world building and plot is so far down the list for me that I actually don't care. Like, I don't care <laughs> if it's about a group of teenagers who go on a quest or whatever. I care about their dynamics and what sort of lessons they learn, if they learn any and how they evolve and that sort of thing. So I look for reviews that are like, this book has, um, the main character is kind of stiff and um, doesn't have a lot of character basically. That will make me put away the book, even if it supposedly has a great plot. But if it's yeah. more of a slower plot and nothing much really happens, but the characters really get into it and like evolve, basically, 
then that will sell me much more. Oh, that's very interesting. So what if, if I do that, you know, I, I like a little bit of a context. So like if they kind of summarize it to the halfway point or something, it gives me a little context for everything else they discuss about the book. Mm -hmm. But no, that's just interesting to hear if I, if I had made a review and I didn't say anything about plot and just jumped right into what I liked about it, what I didn't, what I felt of the, for you, it'd be totally fine. You'd be like, oh, this is great. But whereas somebody else would be like, wait a sec, what's the plot? What's it about? You know, for me, I've, I've kind of do find those details boring, I guess, the plot summary. I guess I'd rather just read the book to get the plot and experience it with the characters, mm. but, but it, for some, it does feel like it's something I need to put in a review though. It just feels like protocol, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I feel like some reviews are like a giant chunk of, this is what actually happens. So this is a plot and then tiny little bit, this is what I thought about the book. And yeah, that, that does happens. happen a lot. You're right, that does happen a lot. And then when they talk about what they liked and didn't like, very shallow. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really get into why exactly they liked this and why they disliked that. So that, that can be a problem I've noticed. But it's hard too, I've realized. So I'm reading a book right now. It's uh, the Southern Guides, the, the, the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. And I'm really liking the book, mm -hmm. but it's funny right now. I can't really tell you why. <laughs> Does that sound crazy? <laughs> that sounds relatable. It's, it, it's suspenseful. I, the characters are fascinating. They're a bunch of, of housewives um, in a book club, you know, and that's their getaway from their family life is going into this book club and talking about these books they love to read and I love the dynamic of that. Uh, there's a lot of things I enjoy about it, but it's, it is, to be honest, hard for me to kind of explain why, you know, and I, I, and I used to complain all the time though, when I'd watch other reviewers and they'd be like, oh, it's so suspenseful. The characters are so great. And be, I'd be sitting there going, why? Why is it so suspenseful? Why are they so great? But now I understand a little more. It's still a problem. I think you should figure out why still but I'm realizing how hard it kind of is actually to explain why <laughs> yeah I feel like that is one of the things you have to really know yourself to know why something like that is great or not great mm. like it comes so, not so much from reading the book but from reading your own reaction to the book okay yeah that's interesting yeah, if you're understanding how your own reactions tick, then, then that can explain why can, you're having that response. I can read a great book and it's like, I can, as a writer, I can see that this is crafted very well and it is quality work, but it just does not sit right with me. Like, it's not my cup of tea and that has yeah. to do with me, not the book. And then I can read a book that's like, okay, this is, I will realize later, mostly from reading bad reviews about the book, actually, but like realize later, this did not have that quality craft to it, but I fell in love with it anyway, because it just struck something in me that matched my type of thing, apparently. What's a book that, example of a book that made you react that way, where you're like, ah, oh, the craft is not very good, but man, I love it. Um, I don't, I can't remember the title right now, but I remember I read one book and I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. This is pretty interesting, actually. Like, I actually read it through. And for me, currently in my life, that is something that is so rare. Like, reading a book from beginning to end, I just have a really hard time doing that. Like maybe every 10 books I pick up, one of them I will finish. Yes, me too. <laughs> Same problem. Same problem. <laughs> and for some reason I just read this one through and then I read reviews and they were like, 
this is so bad. Like the character has no personality and things like that. I'm just reading the reviews and like, huh, yeah, they're actually right about that. Why did I enjoy this? <laughs> That's funny. You know, example for me, it's probably Philip K. Dick. He was a science fiction writer from like the 50s, 60s. A lot of movies are based on his work, like Total Recall, Blade Runner, mm. Minority Report, and stuff like that. I want to say 15. And uh, he, some of his writing is terrible, like his sentences. He uses a lot of adverbs, and they're really clunky, long sentences sometimes. And you know, a lot of his writing's terrible, but his, the worlds he creates are just fascinating. And, mm. and every story is questioning reality, and you just never know which way it's going to bend, you know. And that part's exciting. It's a roller coaster in your mind. But, but yeah, the writing that leads you through it sometimes is awful because he would, part of the reason I found out is he was, that was his main occupation for a lot of his life, but he wasn't making a lot of money from it. Mm -hmm. And so he was trying to publish like seven novels a year or more. And so he was pushing through them as quick as he could, you know, like two yeah. weeks he would get a draft done and then he would revise it in like a week. And then, <laughs> so, so that's partly why the writing was such terrible quality. But here, the one of his books, it was called A Scanner Darkly. Mm -hmm. He spent two years on that book Absolutely. and it was beautifully written. Yeah. So, you know, if he, if he took the time, he did pretty good, but yeah, it's, but that's an example for me. Like I love his stories, can't get enough of them, but as a writer at times, he did struggle quite a bit, but it I'm didn't matter. Writers were actually to stop editing and to actually publish. That is my Achilles heel in a way. Like I will write a draft and then edit or rewrite like seven times before I'm like, well, to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to change this one word again. And I am, did I just change it back to the word it was in the previous draft? And just kind of flipping between <laughs> two synonyms and just keep editing like that. And that gets you nowhere. But I did that at one point. I was like, time to maybe move on. <laughs> See, I've, that's an area I've never gotten that deep in my drafts, and maybe I should take more time of sentence care like that. But just to that point of going, oh, did I switch that word to the one from a previous draft? I've never gotten that deep in my in revision in the revision process of my fiction. But like, I will, I will get to a point. I'll read sentence by sentence and try to make it crisper and more succinct or flow better, but wow, that's impressive though, getting that deep to to analyze a single word that much. Well, I love rhetoric, so analyzing a single word is kind of like, that's my thing. <laughs> and, and I guess when I think about it though, it, it, you know, that single word does change the meaning of the sentence to some degree based yeah. on what word you use there. And so that is more important than I think. I'm actually taking to, and this is something that I do meticulously and that I don't plan on ever stopping doing. I will print out an entire draft and then with different color highlights, highlight every sentence a single character says. Like one character has one color and then I will highlight everything they say throughout the entire book. And I'll do that with all the main characters. So everyone who appears like, multiple times through the story or is even somewhat a little bit important yeah. and I will highlight all of that and then I will read the book through reading only one color so I can see character development and I can see if their sort of speech pattern remains the same throughout like one character doesn't start using swear words when they were meticulous about not doing that earlier or start yeah. using contractions when they wouldn't have done that and just really meticulous about how each character talks to make sure that it sounds authentic and that it matches their story arc wow such care that's no that's 
that's probably what I need to do more. That's interesting. I, I'm re right now for, I'm outlining a couple. I don't know if they're going to be novels yet. They could be short stories at the end of the, the day, but I'm using, have you heard of K.M. Wyland? He's a, she wrote the Dreamlander series and, <clears throat> But uh, no, it's okay. She she also wrote a book called uh, Outline Your Novel, Map Your Way to Success. And I've been trying to use that particular book to outline these stories. And she has a section like that too, where, well, I'll tell you a little bit about it, the process she suggests, because I'm interested in it. But so first she has you write a vague mission statement. And just like, this is going to be a fast paced thriller with a subplot. That's a love story, you know, just some little vague idea. Then you go through and you ask all these what if questions to narrow down the idea to a premise sentence. And then from your premise sentence, you then milk it for all it's worth. And you analyze and answer questions that generate from that premise sentence. And then you start connecting the dots and you write down as quick as you can all the ideas of the plot and whatnot that you think will take place from that, what you've analyzed. But then she does the highlighter thing like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And you go through and you, you highlight certain things like parts that you thought were good, you highlight in a certain color. Things that you thought were vague and sketchy, you highlight in a certain color. And um, she was saying the parts that were vague and, and and kind of sketchy actually were a good direction. She says that if you dig deeper into those spots, you would discover treasure for your story of like, you know, the real prize, the real thing direction your story is to go, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, it's so meticulous. And, and I've never actually approached it this way. I've never, I mean, I've, I would revise, I typically would do three or four revisions of a story you know, when I would, particularly my short stories. And, but yeah, I've never sat down and digged into it this deeply. So it's very new for me. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I feel like that is kind of like speech patterns and word choices and things like that. That is kind of my forte. But descriptions, I am so bad at. Oh, yeah. Like, that was one thing I was actually told about my Lizzie Langdale series from a beta reader that... I say things like the main character looks up at her teacher's face and I never describe what his face looks like. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I think if you are the kind of person to really enjoy really in-depth descriptions, then I'm not the author you want to go to. But right. if you care a lot about single words or speech patterns or character traits being revealed by speech patterns, then that is my kind of thing. That's interesting. Yeah, there's your, your big strength. And you no, know, that, that's a good point, because I guess every author will have weaknesses of some kind. Yeah. But then they'll have strengths of some kind, and then that strength can kind of help the story prevail ultimately. Like, you know, I've mentioned like Stephen King in past videos and like one of his weaknesses is sometimes he'll overwrite, he'll 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 veer into weird backstory directions and he'll fill in way too much. But sometimes that's a strength for the story because it develops the character and makes the later more frightening scenes more impactful because of what we know about him based on where he veered it. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that's partly because he's a pantser. Yeah. He doesn't outline, and so he doesn't. He'll he'll make these weird excursions suddenly, and I don't know if he'll change it in revisions. I I heard in an interview he doesn't always do that. He'll delete stuff, but he doesn't rearrange. But I don't know how true that really is. Maybe he's changed that. But everything. Uh, you rearrange everything. I have the kids. <laughs> sat at a table with my complete manuscript printed out and scissors and tape just cutting up oh. pages and mixing them up like okay that goes there and taping it in and <laughs> it's a nice way to edit on the computer afterwards you know there's this book i had it was called now write 
fiction. And there was a section where it, it suggested to you revision techniques. Mm -hmm. One technique that was really odd, and I tried it, and it didn't help me at all. But maybe I'll try it again one day just for fun. Maybe I did something wrong. But they suggested, so first, count all the words in your manuscript. Or you can use, like, your computer, and you can, whatever that technique where it shows you the most repeated word. Oh, yeah. I, I guess you use that option on your computer. And then you, I guess you write, like, that word down, and then you write, like, synonyms to it, or images and themes that come to your mind based on that word. Mm -hmm. And then you, like, you create, like, a spine for that theme or whatever. But yeah, and but it was having me like, I can't remember everything, but it was having me cut out like certain words and themes that I generated from that. And or I was taping them and pasting them around. It didn't help me at all at the time. It just created greater confusion. But, but yeah, I've heard of, of a lot of techniques like that, that writers like to use for revision and all that. And, but you like to cut and paste and move around quite a bit, eh? Yeah. Definitely. Again, I, I pounce, so I just, I go one way and then I sort of sometimes figure out that, hey, maybe that wasn't quite the way to go, or maybe I took a wrong detour and then I'll have to go back and change that. But if you yeah. don't do that immediately, like, I know a lot of authors say, never edit while you're writing. Get the first draft done and then edit. But if I try to do that, I end up going like okay we're going this way and then slowly detouring and like this does not lead to anywhere good like this is a crabby book right now <laughs> so i have to go back and delete all that stuff and then try to find another way to go and if you have written the entire book when you get to like this point and you continue writing here it will be crap in the end and you're like, why go through all that work when I know it's going to be crap, right? <laughs> yeah. Better just delete the crap part and just start from a point where you can actually move forward to a good place. <laughs> no, I, I hear you there. I, I preach the idea of just get through the rough draft, get through the rough draft. But, you know, I don't practice it as well as I preach it. So because I often will stop if I sense it's not going the right way. And I'll, what I do, the technique I use often is I'll have a conversation with myself on paper mm. about what I think's wrong, you know? And But I have a lot of unfinished stories because of that. Because I went, this is going wrong. I'm done, <laughs> you know? But then I'll get on Twitter and go, just push through it. You can get to the end and then fix it later, but I don't always practice that, so it's BS, sadly. <laughs> but if you push through to get to the end and you're on the wrong track, you will not get where you're supposed to go. Yeah, you ended up in the wrong territory anyway, so that's why I'm trying outlining this time, so I can get a lot of that out of the way, and then maybe I'll, I'll know where I'm going when I actually get working on it. So I've, I, I used to outline a lot, when I was younger in my teenage years and then I stopped doing that later because I got into college and I had a lot of prof well it wasn't professors just other students saying don't waste your time with that just it's anti-creative it's you know and I thought well maybe I'll try it and so I with short stories it sometimes works because you know it's you have less content you have to deal with but with the novel I haven't really been able to succeed with with just pantsing it but, I hate all these, no, don't do that, or always do this kind of rules. Like, <laughs> no, like, outlining doesn't hinder creativity if that is how your creativity works. Here's something else I've noticed, too, is a lot of those writers that say they pants, mm -hmm. a lot of them do still outline. They just don't necessarily write it down. They'll think about it. Yeah. Like, like one of the authors I like, he says he'll he'll sit, lay in bed at night before falling asleep and he'll think about the story he's going to write. Me and too. he'll do that for weeks and weeks before he actually writes it. Mm. But he's outlining. 
he's just not formally outlining. It's an informal outline, just kept in his mind instead of put on paper. So they still outline, they just do it differently. I don't know. I feel like I mostly do like, I feel like an outline is more like, okay, this is the scene and then this is the next scene and sort of a more systematic approach where if I lie in bed thinking about my story, it's like a specific scene that I'm playing like a movie in my head and just, yeah, yeah. okay, that choice took me there. What if I start the scene over? Can I get to somewhere else? And sometimes I will get like five different versions of this, depending on uh -huh. one sentence that was maybe said in anger or in mm. compassion instead. And it changes everything. So I kind of work through like what I want the story to be, where I want it to go, and right. dig beneath that to where the story wants to go. Wow, no, there's something interesting there. Okay, let me make sense of that. So, so you rehearse in your mind different directions you want the scene to go that you want, but then you say you eventually discover what the story wants. What is that experience like when you discover what the story wants? That's fascinating to me. I think basically what I do is if I'm in a bad mood or angry mood, instead of taking it out on friends and family who are real people, I just play a scene in my head where I can sort of let go of that anger with my characters. Yeah. Like one character gets to be really angry. And then the more they shout and scream, the more I'm like, oh, okay, so that's what you're saying. Like just letting it all out and just seeing sort of like that thing where you just write and then see what happens. Like, um, I can't remember that word. Well, you just start writing and you don't stop for like five minutes. Free write? Free right. write? Free um, writing? Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, free writing? Yeah, I think we have a different word for that in Danish and I've heard like two or three words for it in English, so. Right. <laughs> But no, I hear you on that. So, so the, the first part, when you're discovering what you want it to be, that's you kind of, it's you using it as a way to get your emotions out. To yeah. express the Basically emotions. Therapy for me. Okay, okay. And, and then, then after you've gotten that out, your mind's cooler, and then you're yeah. able to look at, okay, what is, where does this really want to go, though? Yeah. What's the most logical course for it as a story, now that I got my emotions expressed? Like, I no longer have to force my ideas onto the story. I can let the story just evolve naturally. That's cool. Okay. And that makes sense to me based on some other authors I've heard speak on the subject where, because I've heard authors say like the rough, the rough draft is hot, meaning emotional. Yeah. And then, and then the, the second draft, the revision draft is cold, analytical. And so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense now to me. Interesting. Like when I was a kid, I, I really wanted, like I told you before, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Yeah. And I was a huge James Bond movie fan when I was 13, 14. <laughs> but I would, I would sit there and I would act out scenes in my room. You know, suddenly I'm, I'm Bond and I'm run, chasing after an airplane like in GoldenEye. And I've got to, you know, get on a motorcycle and jump onto it and jump off a cliff, you know. And so I'd sit there and I'd rehearse the scene over and over. But like you were saying, I would have all these different directions I would try to mm. take. And then eventually I'd go, no, this is the right way. And then that's what I would write on my script. So I would act it out and then to figure it out and then, and then write it down. Amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but... I think one of the things that we have really talked about this uh, session, or whatever, this video, is that authors have different strengths and different weaknesses. And I think what is really important as a reader is to not just figure out if, like, not just figure out what an author's strengths or weaknesses are, but figure out if they match yours. Like, 
if one of your reading pet peeves is like for me it is authors who try to control the story or make their characters act the way they want instead of letting it evolve naturally then you won't match well with those kinds of books and that is for me that is what i'm trying to do whenever i read a book i want to see do my favorite things or my pet peeves do they match what this author does or does not do because if it does then chances are i will like other works by this author yeah cool i think that's a good way to approach it and i think we I guess I think we kind of do that subconsciously too, you know? Yeah. Because I've never, like, I've never found myself as a reader approaching it that way consciously, but but I'm sure when a book speaks to me on the shelf at, at Barnes & Noble or in my Kindle search mm -hmm. log, you know, there's there's reasons that book is calling out to me, and it's it's probably because there's a part of my personality that's identifying with it. I have honestly read books, like, series even, where I get to the third book and the author does one tiny little thing. I was like, nope, that is not okay. You did, you just try to control the character or something like that. And I'm, I'm out. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter if I love the first two books. If you do that, I'm throwing the third book away. I'm not reading it. Holy cow, wow. Brutal. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, that's I don't why know. I'm I, such a hard time finishing books. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Yeah, I don't know. I've never... I don't know. I've never... I don't remember an instance where I've reacted that way. I have... There have been moments I've disliked a character. Or, uh, here's one thing I guess I have that has. I read a book called Cypher by Kathy Koja. It was a, it, the characters were just very unlikable people. All of them. There wasn't one character that had a, any redeemable quality about them. And I remember I just felt kind of disgusted. And yeah. the, reason I, the reason I got the book though was like, wow, there's, that seems so different from my own life. And I guess I wanted to explore that. But then when I got deep into their life, I was like, I want to get out of here. <laughs> There's another one I read called Goth. It was a mm -hmm. Japanese horror novel. I can't remember the author's name. But the, all the characters were either serial killers or they were these two characters obsessed with serial killers. And it, I just felt like throwing up. Yeah. It was interesting. Like I was interested in how different their world was than mine. That's what called my eyes to the book in the first place. But being in that world for hundreds of pages, I just had to get out. I, or I was going to just puke all over it. So <laughs> if it was a short story, maybe I would have liked it better. Yeah. Like when I read Red Dragon or Silence of the Lambs, you had the contrasting detective who was likable mm -hmm. and redeemable contrasted to the serial killer and so i could be in that world more i could last the hundreds of pages and feel okay and thrilled and fascinated but the other one where it was just every character was disgusting i was like i don't want to be here i even threw the book in the garbage because <laughs> i disliked it so much <laughs> but i actually i really recognize that i was reading a book and um yeah, this is one of the classics, one of the ones that everybody loves, and I just, I cannot get through it. It is Jane Eyre. So it's like- Oh, I haven't, I have only read a small excerpt of that in a Victorian lit class I think I took years ago. Yeah. I haven't read the whole book though. The thing is, I absolutely adored Withering Heights. I was like, well, if one Bronte sister can do this incredible book, then I've got to read the others too. But I yeah. think Jane Eyre, the character, is so judgmental and so self-righteous. And I know she had a horrible childhood and I know people have been horrible to her her whole life. But she's just like, okay, Rochester is a good guy. Him I like, everybody else I hate. And it doesn't matter if their only flaw is that they talk a little bit too much 
or drink the wrong kind of tea or something. Like, she just hates on everybody that isn't her love interest or herself. And I, oh, I could not stand it. Um, my friend's gonna hate me for saying that because she loves Jane Eyre. And yeah. <laughs> I cannot get through it. <laughs> wow. That's funny. Huh. Yeah, you never know what reaction you'll have. Is that's what's interesting about that one too? Is it's such a popular book and yeah, people adore you know, like you said. But for you, you just can't stand. I'm trying to think of one for me that I couldn't get through. That was a classic, good one. I struggled at times with Moby Dick. I still want to try again though. I like I actually, one, yeah. it's so dense and and long, but but the writing is good. And, okay. and I think I'll try again sometime. But the times I've tried, it's just, I've drowned in well oil trying to read it. Because <laughs> it's just so dense and wordy and I don't know. I tried Dracula at one point, which is like, it's such a short book. But Oh, Dracula? Yeah. But I, I made like the mistake it. of coming into the book expecting horror the way we view it in modern eyes and like oh okay. okay so he crawls down the wall head first I'm like that's not scary that's just this this isn't scary like i was like, expecting really i was expecting to be scared and i was just bored <laughs> bored see i loved that book i thought it was very thrilling and Interesting. It, it wasn't scary in the sense of like a horror movie that yeah. something jumps out and and makes you jump. It it was it was meant to get under your skin and and terrorize you. It just in, didn't make, for me, and I think that was mainly because I had the wrong expectations coming in. So yeah. I'm gonna wait a few years, and if I don't get run over by a bus by then, then I'll try it again. <laughs> yeah, give it a try again. I. Yeah, it is very different, you're right, than than a lot of the horror movies and stuff you see nowadays. It's a different approach to the horror. It's not trying to jump scare you or gross you out. It's, it's trying to creep you out. Mm. Like, uh, there was a girl, I remember I read that for a Victorian Lit class, and I there was a girl in the class that had the very opposite direction. She said, but this is actually disturbing. But she was expecting it to be horrifying like most of the horror movies she saw, cheap, a cheap jump scare. And mm. she was surprised because she said, this is actually disturbing me. It's not just making me jump. I feel disturbed. <laughs> it got under her skin and terrified her, you know. So, no, that's interesting to hear that contrast with you, though. <laughs> I think I made it through, like, half the book, and I was like, I'm not going to get through this like this so i got an auto dramatization of it and then i listened through that just so i had the ending of like okay i can put this away now i don't <laughs> have to worry about not having finished it have you read uh, frankenstein no but i really want to <laughs> yeah that's why i read that one years ago it was i remember it being just very uh wordy and poetic that's the not, not, i kind of like that yeah, I at the time I didn't know any better and I was I I really liked it at the time although I think about it now there's certain scenes that felt really sketchy to me unbelievable like when she's when when I the monster is sitting outside the house of I can't remember if it was the doctor or somebody else and he's listening to the books they read and stuff and he learns gains knowledge mm -hmm. just from sitting out there for days listening to him and becomes really smart. That part, I remember, seemed unbelievable to me. But I was 18 at the time when I read it. I'm 33 now, so a lot of years have passed since <laughs> since I read it. So I don't know what I think now. But that's another one to read. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> have you read Dorian Gray? No, nope, I have not. That one I like. That one. <laughs> I actually did that one for a book club. And one of my friends was like, she is, we both sort of like classicals. Like, I enjoy Shakespeare and she enjoys Jane Austen. I like Wuthering Heights and she likes Jane Eyre. So 
<laughs> we were the only two in this book club who actually sort of enjoyed classical books. Um, it was my pick, so I picked the classical. And you're like, Durian not only does not age physically, but also not ages mentally. I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. I thought he was just a jerk. <laughs> but now it makes sense why, yeah. He's, he's not, yeah. He's still remaining childish in his mental view, I guess. Huh? Imagine having the maturity of a 17-year-old, but having lived for a hundred years. That is <laughs> such a sounds strange Sounds horrifying thing. to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like it could be a good story. Yeah, it just sounds like a horrifying Great thing story. to be stuck. Yeah. I would hate to be stuck in a 17-year-old mentality forever. That's worse than you hell. You would love it. What was that? That's worse than hell. Oh, no, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we agreed on that. Yeah, it sounds awful. <laughs> no, interesting. We went and we started out on reader responses and uh, to writer's work and vice versa. And then we veered into our responses to books. So. Ah, I think it was a good segue, so. Yeah. But I think, should we conclude the session then? Yeah, let's. <laughs> All righty. Well, yes, this was Authors Unite, and please subscribe and, and like and share this video with your fellow, fellow readers as well as writers. And uh, my name's Alan Hunston, and And I'm CK, and I hope you don't lynch me for not liking Jane Eyre. <laughs> They're gonna come after us, no. <laughs> but uh Alice, please yeah. don't make me. <laughs> but uh we will talk to you guys again soon, so see ya.